What do tiny chairs, bricks, and barf bags all have in common? There's plenty of political bags. You know, I've got a two George Bush bags, uh, a Hillary Clinton bag, a couple of Obama bags, a Trump bag, a Newt Gingrich bag, a Mike Dukakis bag. You know, it runs a spectrum. So this is a McFeely fire brick, and the McFeely family made a lot of money uh, with these. And their grandson was Fred McFeely Rogers, Mr. Rogers. People are amazed when they come in the museum. The word is always wow because they just never expected to see what just a new appreciation of chairs. They're all uncommon collections belonging to extraordinary collectors. I'm Kyone Wolf, and they're all coming up next on Audacious, right after the news. From Connecticut Public Radio in Hartford, this is Audacious. I'm Kyone Wolf. When I was a teenager, I loved David Brand sunflower seeds. How much did I love David Brand sunflower seeds? Five 30-gallon garbage bags full of spent David Brand sunflower seed shells in the garage is how much I loved David Brand sunflower seeds. Why did I have five 30-gallon garbage bags full of spent David Brand sunflower seed shells in our garage? I don't know. And why, stacked next to those five 30-gallon garbage bags full of David Brand sunflower seed shells, were also bags of Planters Brand spent sunflower seed shells and Frito-Lay Brand spent sunflower seed shells seed shells. I don't know why, but it was a collection. A weird collection, and I was proud of it. Until the town of Farmington trash collectors unceremoniously lofted them, heavier than you'd think they'd be, into their trucks and hauled them away. And that was the end of that. So, today, a salute to uncommon collections and the people who collect them. You're going to meet Chicago's own connoisseur, of brick collecting, and you'll meet a woman who's the owner of the Museum of Miniature Chairs in Stone Mountain, Georgia. But first, let's start with a bang, or a barf. Steve Silberberg of Hull, Massachusetts is the proud owner of not only barfbags.com, but airsicknessbags.com, and he's collected over 3,000 barf bags over the course of 40 years. Steve took me back to when the thought first occurred to him. So in 1981, I was taking a flight from Boston to San Francisco, and I looked in the seat back, and I had one of those revelations. I mean, it wasn't like a light came out and shone upon me and said, oh, (laughs) grab this. But I saw the bag, and I thought, I bet nobody collects these. Maybe I could start doing this. It turns out I was wrong. There are are other collectors, but uh, not that many. (laughs) Well, in fact, I noticed you have on your website, if you are interested in becoming a collector, people can get in touch and you'll help help them get started, right? Absolutely. One of the things in collecting bags is I assume in collecting thimbles or or, um, Mr. Potato Heads or whatever, or or whatever the generic name for potato doll is now, (laughs) that you tend to get duplicates. And so I have a whole bunch of duplicates overrunning my office. And uh, so part of it is being magnanimous. I like to think, oh, I'll get somebody else started and then we can swap. And part of it is reducing clutter. (laughs) In your collection, you have more than just barf bags for airlines and boats. You have one, I saw you have one from the Connecticut Working Families Party. They made a barf bag that said, use this barf bag if Aetna's profits are making you sick, which is a delightful way of of communicating a value, of making something memorable. It's like a prop. It's like a, it's something that you could take with you and and hang it on your wall or make other people laugh. So it's not just a souvenir. Thank you. What kind of bags are sticking out in your collection that that are outstanding in that sense? Yes. The the original attraction was, hey, go on a plane grab a bag. Hey, cool collection. But I have found 
that my favorite bags are ones that were meant to make a statement, whether it's political or advertising or something that was never meant to be used. So for example, you'll find, I have a few bags that are political in nature, but they're more like, oh, do taxes make you sick? And does such and such a candidate make you sick? And I, I find, dare I say, that they're delightful when they have social commentary upon them. And so those are, those are my favorite. Sometimes they're used as advertising pieces. There's a Eastern Federal Credit Union or something like that. I, I, I should remember off the top of my head, but I don't. You have over 3,000 bags. It's okay if you don't remember the copy on everyone. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, thank you for being forgiving on that. But there's plenty of political bags. You know, I've got a two George Bush bags, uh, a Hillary Clinton bag, a couple of Obama bags, a Trump bag, a uh, Newt Gingrich bag, a uh, Mike Dukakis bag. You know, it, it runs a spectrum. I bet the George W. Bush bag would be. Yeah, it's W. I don't have an HW bag, but if anyone has one, please send it to me. Well, that I was I was saying that because, you know, W famously barfed yes. at a very important dinner, uh, which gives it a little more uh, relevance. But um, when you say, like, if anybody has one, let me know, where do you get your bags? How do you scrounge around for them? How do they come into your collection? Mostly these days I trade with other collectors. However, I also have a Google agent that scours the, uh, the web every day for new websites that have the words vomit bag, air sickness bag, barf bag, whatever. And it sends me a report every day to check out. And every now and then you'll go, oh, look at that. This uh, such and such a grunge band or metal band or whatever it has a new tour and they're featuring a barf bag as part of it. And then getting that can be difficult. You know, their giveaways, sometimes they give them away at bars and then the next day they throw them all out because who would possibly want this? <laughs> His name is Steve. <laughs> <laughs> What is a bag that if your house were burning down, you would grab one bag? What is that bag? Oh, wow. That's, that's so much pressure. <laughs> oh, well, I got the space shuttle bag. I would keep that. Wait, you have a space shuttle bag? I do have a space shuttle bag. <laughs> Come on. What, tell me how you got that. That's so cool. <laughs> For years, I wrote away. Uh, it, was, it wasn't an obsession or anything like that. But even in the 80s, I wrote away to NASA trying to obtain them. And they would send a form saying, this is a national secret. It's, we do not give away this sort of thing. <laughs> but back in the late 90s, I had a friend whose cousin worked for NASA. And I can't say for sure how it came to me, but somehow a bag came my way from a contact at NASA. Actually, I can say, but I, I don't I don't really want to get anyone in trouble. That's okay. Will you describe it? Because it doesn't look exactly like the kind of airbag that you might be picturing, right? First of all, it's hermetically sealed in, in plastic. And inside is the bag, so most bags you see on planes are paper or wax or plastic or something like this. This is kind of a tyvek -y mylar material, and it's rolled up. And on the outside of it, it's got some, some language that, that uh, describes it as for use in case of space sickness. And it's got like a little picture of a, a spaceman or space woman could be space person a, a space person um <laughs> yeah but i mean it was it's just a suit and somebody actually whoever designed this put a little uh decorative raspberry drizzle on it so it looks like a you know the background's kind of like the uh, a little curvy line looks like what's on your plate under a dessert so a nice little artistic flair yeah and I thought, that's a nice touch for something so utilitarian that, uh, that's essentially just thrown out. Some people love flying with the same airline and they're, you know, frequent flyers and, and they, they know what to expect from that experience. Do you ever find yourself wanting to, say, plan a vacation with an airline or a ship or something that would have a, a barf bag that's different than you normally do just so you can get the new bags? Um... It is a conundrum. I'm 
probably too cheap to do that. If, if, if everything else is the same, I would do it. Uh, part of the thing is that since getting, since um, air sickness is no longer the issue it once was, there's become less of an emphasis on airlines providing them. And, there, and also, especially in the United States, there's a de-emphasis. They, the corporate powers that be do not want people to think that they can get ill on a flight. So they downplay them. Um, you'll find in other countries, some of the Scandinavian countries, they look at a bag as, hey, this is a great design opportunity to showcase our airline. But in the United States, it's not that way. All this to say is that airlines are trying to go more generic and so the opportunity to get a new bag, a current bag on an airline is much less than it used to be. So no, sorry, I probably would not go on a flight just to get a bag. Why do you think fewer people are getting sick on airlines? Is it because of the availability and efficacy of certain drugs? Uh, no, I think, uh, I think avionics have come a long way in terms of the electronics and control systems that are in planes are much more, uh, much more robust. It's a smoother ride. Yeah. Ah, well, that makes sense. <laughs> the fact that I didn't like recognize that means it's, it's working, right? You know, like I think I'm this, I don't think I'm this advanced human being that I don't get <laughs> air sick or seasick, but huh, there is something to be said for the better technology making that happen. Well, you know, much like the nut allergies to come about, we have become superhumans that are no longer susceptible to uh, air sickness. So now we just need to apply that to general suffering. <laughs> yeah, yes, <laughs> exactly. We can get there. There will come a day where we'll look back on, on our unnecessary suffering and think, ha, ah, <laughs> my ride is so smooth now. You know, if you're Buddhist, you would believe that suffering is necessary and inevitable. I love that we're getting into Buddhism during the air sickness bag segment because, <laughs> because it, I mean, it is touching on something that like there is the smoothness of life makes you less sick. And that's true whether you are on a plane or a boat in a car or going through a very difficult time or just another Tuesday. It's all a parable, right? Steve, <laughs> thank you for taking us there. Jeez. Well, you know what? Since we're we're in a bigger realm now. What do you hope happens to your collection after you die? So I've been thinking about that. Um, the, the short answer is I will send it to other collectors. The, the ones that I have in mind to send it to are all older than me. So, but that doesn't mean I can't die before them. In some ways, it's a bunch of worthless bags, but in other ways, some might consider them valuable. The guy who had the largest collection in the world, Nick Vermulin, he died a few years back and his estate wanted to sell his 7,000 bags for $40,000 or something like that. And if I had Bezos money, I'd buy it, you know, but I might send it off to some museum to get a tax write off for my estate. But I don't know if you have any ideas, I could send them to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll go through the collection and I'll, I'll just be like, this one, this one, this one. I know I'm not going to get the NASA bag. But you really have to have a passion for it. Yeah. And not many people do. If they're interested, and especially if they collect, what do you think it does tell you about people, the other people who collect? What are they like and how are they like you and how are they not like anybody else? Well, I think it shows a high level of intelligence, sensitivity, and humility. No, I'm just thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to let you go. I don't know, man. I'm interviewing you. You're probably going, God, get over yourself, dude. <laughs> but so here, here's something I've noticed. And I, I think, you know, in a more general sense, there are people who collect things and people who don't collect things. Like you go into people's houses and their place is bereft of anything. It's just very utilitarian and no clutter whatsoever. And then there's the hoarder on the other side. I believe that there is, I don't know if it's genetic or socially engineered into you, but there's a level of collection that's kind of innate in humans. Um, you know, like a pack rat has, has this obsession to collect. And I think people have that and it's a continuum, you know, much like 
sexuality. It's a continuum between straight and gay, let's say. And the same thing with collecting. For me, I've kind of focused on one thing, although I used to collect sardine keys, whatever that's worth. It gets me pondering, you know, what do I collect? Right. Like I love onions more than almost anything. So anything onion art, I have stuffed animal onions. Um, of course, really? actual onions. Um, yeah, I love onions. If people know this about you, once that gets out, people will bring you onion stuff. And it brings me such joy, such joy. <laughs> Very easy to shop for just a picture of an onion. Uh an onion. Like on my birthday, I asked people to bring the most beautiful onion they can find. When I die, if everyone would come and bring the most beautiful onion to my service, and then we can, you know, donate them or something like to me that it's it's such a beautiful, easy, lovely gift. And it means so much to me. I will tell you, I have never heard of that, but I think it's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. I think your barf bags are wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Steve Silberberg, for talking with me. Thank you, Kyle. Looking for a barrel, looking for a toilet, they should have a barf bag. Barf bag, barf bag, barf, barf, barf bag, barf. When we get back. I have a case with chairs inside bottles, just like people have ships in bottles. Sit back, relax, and take in the world of miniature chairs. I'm Kyone Wolf. This is Audacious. Stay with me. to be ready you've got to be prepared you've got to carry a barf bag everywhere you go this is audacious i'm kyone wolf today you're meeting people who are the keepers of uncommon collections you just met a man who owns over three thousand barf bags and later i'm telling you you're never going to look at bricks the same way again but right now imagine you're sitting in a chair it's a tiny chair. In fact, scratch that, the chair's too tiny to sit in. And this chair is inside of a bottle on a shelf in a museum full of other whimsical tiny chairs. Whom do you have to thank for this one-of-a-kind, mind-boggling reality? That would be Barbara Hartsfield. Not only is she a psychiatric nurse, but she's also the owner of the Museum of Miniature Chairs in sunny Stone Mountain, Georgia. Now, as we were researching Barbara and her collection, we found that in interviews, she regularly pointed out passionately that it's important to understand that these are not dollhouse chairs. They're miniature chairs. So I asked her, what's the difference? So a lot of people with dollhouse furniture, they're on scale, super small. My chairs are many tools, but they are functional. Functional lamps, functional cookie jars, functional teapots. In the shape of chairs. Yeah. Or containing chairs or... Right. That's the difference. But that's been the big issue with branding the museum. Because most people hear the word chair, they think of full-size chair. And they hear the word mini tools and they think of dollhouse furniture. So you got a few obstacles to sort of yeah. work with. So it's a branding issue. So I'm constantly saying not dollhouse furniture. <laughs> well, I will make sure that that is like the scrolling marquee in front of this show. Is It's not dollhouse furniture. Not dollhouse furniture. Don't be confused. But not like people are amazed when they come in the museum. The word is always wow. Because they just never expected to see what... Uh, just a new appreciation of chairs. Let's back up. How in the world did this start with you? What happened? Well, I didn't plan this at all. Who does? <laughs> no, I didn't. It started 30 years ago while I was working at, well, I still work as a psychiatric nurse. And I was interested in pregnant patients that had mental illness and their young children. So I decided, okay, I'll write a nursing article on a uh, mental health patient with uh, pregnancy. So I said to stay focused with my purpose, I decided to buy a chair and put a baby in it. And that was in my uh, room where I was writing the article. So that's just kind of set the mood. And this was a this was a tiny chair. Yeah. And a tiny fake baby. Yeah. It, it was more like it kept me focused. And then I had to put the baby in a chair. So when I went to look for this one chair, 
That's when I found all these unusual chairs. So after the article was published in 1991, I decided to just start shopping for these unique chairs as a hobby. And where would you find them? Like online? Would you go to places? I really was determined to just shop for chairs. So I would map out a a plan for each weekend. I would go to certain antique shops. I would go to antique shows like the Lakewood Antique Festival and the Scots Antique Festival. See, they came the second weekend of every month. Now you have 1,500 people coming from the Southeast selling, you know, their uh, collectibles. And they used to call me the chair lady because they would look for chairs that they thought I didn't have. So, you know, it's funny as you're talking, I'm thinking there's a place up here in New England called Brimfield. Yeah. And it, uh, you know about Brimfield. Yeah. And I'm thinking, you know, the next time I go to Brimfield, maybe I should look for some chairs for Barbara. Like <laughs> that happens, right? People just feel like, ah, oh, maybe I can help her out because it's such a unique thing. Right. Other than that, I would just go around the perimeter to uh, antique shops and also just into the retail departments of stores. You know, around holidays, you would find holiday chairs. So the three categories that I would look for would be holiday chairs, functional chairs and unusual chairs like horseshoe chairs, ink wheels. I mean, I would go to TJ Maxx looking to see what chairs they had for the holiday, especially at the end, after the sale, after the <laughs> holiday. <laughs> yeah, some people are looking for sales on, you know, Christmas pantyhose, but no, you're looking for those chairs. Yes, I, I stayed focused. Like <laughs> I could cover the antique festival. They had about eight bills and I could cover it in three hours because I was focused on chairs. I wasn't stopping, looking at everything that they had. I was for chairs. Laser focused. Right. I was. Just like when you were working on that paper, laser focused. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. So 30 years later uh, and 3,000 chairs later, here here we are talking about this collection. You're in the Book of Guinness World Records. If someone were to walk into your museum and ask, what is the weirdest chair in here? What's that weirdest chair? Well, I don't know about weird, <laughs> but uh, I have a case with chairs inside bottles, just like people have ships in bottles. Oh. I have a wide variety of chairs inside bottles. I have a three room museum and I have cases in each one, display cases, and the cases have background themes. So for that one will be the uh, chair inside the bottle. And the second one will be the chair inkwells, and that's more antique-ish. I get excited with the chair inkwells and the chair inside the bottles. And it must be cool to see the faces of people, I'm sure of all ages, who come into your museum and they're like, what? Wow. Wow. I need to write an article on the wow experience from visiting the museum. That's You know, I've learned a lot of things with this uh, collecting because, like I say, I'm a nurse. But I learned how to uh, write articles, take pictures. Instead of counting my chairs, I used to take pictures of every chair I bought. So I had, when I got ready for my Guinness World Record, I had 27 books of pictures. So the Guinness people say, well, they can't just look at pictures. You got to get those chairs out of storage. So I took those 27 books (laughs) and organized the house so that the two witnesses could see them. Like in the kitchen, that would be the teapot chairs, the uh, salt and pepper shaker chairs, cooker jar chairs. And in the den, I would have, I had a Christmas tree, but nothing but chair ornaments. So I had a coffee table with about, probably about 200 chair ornaments. So they were able to count by flipping through the photo album and then look to see the pictures. So that was my count. You couldn't go one, two, three. <laughs> that wouldn't have worked. No, that's not how they roll at Guinness. We did a whole episode of people who have unusual Guinness World Records. We, I can't believe we didn't find you in time for that one, but I'm glad we found you in time for this one. <laughs> There's a question that I have from Sophia, who is the daughter of my producer, Jessica. Sophia's 10 years old, and she asks, do you sometimes wish you were so small that you could actually sit in one of these chairs? No. <laughs> <laughs> You're perfectly fine on your own size. You know, I have a, a motto. Chairs with a different purpose, not for sitting. So I don't think about sitting. It's more 
they have a different purpose. That nullifies my next question, which was going to be the inverse of that, which is if there were a chair in your collection that you could wave a magic wand over and it would all of a sudden be sittable in, which one would that be? But you're saying there there isn't one. It doesn't really, it's not, no. Different purpose, not for sitting. Got it. I know this is a strange question, but it occurred to me. How do you insure the collection? Like, I don't want to need to know like how much it's worth or anything like that because it's priceless. But when you were insuring this business, did they have to sort of get their heads around what they were insuring? Well, I had to find a special insurance company that did collectibles because like State Farm, all state, those insurance, it, it was too much of a risk. So I had to pay more for a private insurance company, which is fine. But you don't pass that price along to your visitors. It's $5 for adults, $2 for children, right? So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's really just for fun and to share. That's why I still work. <laughs> <laughs> what? You're not going to get filthy rich from your tiny chair museum? Right. No? Oh, okay. I will not. Stick with nursing? <laughs> but it takes the pressure off of me. So if I can sit in there and nobody comes in or if somebody comes in, they don't have to fight off, then I won't. It's not like my bread and uh, bread and butter. Plus, you get paid in wow. Yeah, I do. And just seeing the expression on people's face. When people do come in, whether they have the $5, $2, or you just say, come on in, come on in. Yeah. I picture you seeing them and their interest in your museum, which is such a distinct museum. And I wonder if you feel sort of a kinship with them because like anybody could collect Zippos or bottle caps or matchbox cars. But this is such an interesting, specific, uncommon collection that for someone to be interested in your collection, in a way, they have to be on some similar wavelength as you. So do you feel some sort of connection with people who come through? I do. I get excited when I see people who have, they show a passion for it like I do. And also the experience, I just get excited to wonder that's the expression. I like to, for them that feel like they've been on a trip without going out of the town. They didn't have to fly, drive, stay in a hotel, but it was a treat that they will always remember. Yeah, like they're transported. Yeah. And that that sense of awe that, you know, like it's just this world is pretty. I know you know this world is difficult and chaotic and beautiful and everything but the moments where you can be present and feel awe I mean it doesn't get much better than that it's like a stress buster it's like you leave your stress outside the door and you come into a place where you can just relax and enjoy get away from all of the problems that we read about in the news so it's like it's still mental health I really haven't gotten away from the mental health. I just changed focus. <laughs> it's real interesting. Though. A lot of times the wife would come and the husband would stay in the car. I would have to go out to the parking lot <laughs> and tell the husband, come, come and look. You, you'll be surprised. And then they'll come in and they, then they totally surprised. And when they leave, how, how are they? Granted, granted. And I let them take pictures, too. I like people to take pictures so they have a souvenir because people won't believe them when they try to explain it to them. I say, you need to take a picture. You must see it to believe it. That's another motto. You must see it to believe it. <laughs> well, Barbara Hartsfield, thank you for your service and thank you for talking with me. You're welcome. Bye-bye. <laughs> After the break. Part of what I love about Brick is it's something you don't expect to be interesting. But when you actually start paying attention to it, it is so interesting. The beauty of bricks. I'm Kyone Wolf. This is Audacious. Be right back. This is Audacious. I'm Kyone Wolf. Today, Uncommon Collections and the collectors who collect them. You've already met the owner of a nauseatingly large barf bag collection, and you've reclined into a conversation with the operator of a museum full of tiny chairs. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce you to the man who will blow your mind about bricks. 
Will Quam of Chicago, Illinois, will be taking us through brick and thin. Now, I know what you're probably feeling. Surprise. Befuddlement. Turns out this is a reaction that Will gets all the time. It's generally always surprise and befuddlement. I think it's very unexpected, which which I sort of enjoy. You know, part of what I love about Brick is it's something you don't expect to be interesting, but when you actually start paying attention to it, it is so interesting uh, and so varied and full of so much nuggets of stuff. What's your earliest memory of being intrigued by Bricks? So I read two books. The first was At Home by Bill Bryson. And in that book, he talks about how, you know, brick making has changed. You know, he's, he's trying to, he's talking about all the, you know, history of the way we live. And, and one of those things, is how modern bricks tend to be larger and much more uniform because the way they're made has changed, going from this very sort of randomized coal-fired process to a natural gas, really standardized process. And that led me doing some noticing. And then the big one was I read a book called On Looking by a psychologist named Alexander Horwitz. And it's all about she takes different walks around her neighborhood with different people who are experts. You know, everything from a physical therapist, you know, how does a physical therapist look through the world and see the way people move? Or a historic sign painter, how do, what do they see? Or what does her dog, how does her dog move through the world? And I started to notice that in Chicago, um, we have a lot of repetitive building types. You know, we have bungalows and we have what are called, you know, two flats and three flats, these buildings of apartments stacked on top of each other. And my block in here in Chicago is all two flats and three flats. And structurally, they're all identical. But the brick is what makes each one unique. Some have one color, some have one texture. And so I started, that's really the thing that started getting me to notice. Uh, and my original job was I was a sort of itinerant theater teacher. And so I was going all over Chicago. And so I was seeing a lot of these same forms, but depending on what neighborhood I was in or what era a building was from, I would see different brick textures and colors and patterns. And that's really what led to the obsession. Let's talk about your collection. Let's talk. What is the brick you would save if the brick building you're in, as I can tell from your background, if the brick building you're in were on fire, what's the one brick you would tuck under your arm and make your way out with? Well, my brick building would never be on fire because it's a good brick building. And that's why Chicago, because of the 1871 fire, is made of brick. But I can I keep it on my desk so I can show you right here. So this is a McFeely fire brick. And these particular fire bricks were made in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, in western Pennsylvania for Coke furnaces. And the McFeely family made a lot of money uh, with these. And their grandson was Fred McFeely Rogers, Mr. Rogers. Okay. Yeah. I completely understand why you would save that brick. And he's my hero. And so this is the brick I keep on, on my desk and I would save, uh, I would save from a fire. From an interior fire. An interior <laughs> fire, yeah. Caused undoubtedly by my attempts to cook. Do you, how do you get your bricks? Do you, and do you ever, forgive me, steal them? I get my bricks a couple ways. Uh, I, you find them just on the street. You know, especially here in Chicago, I have a lot of, I don't have one right by me, but I have a lot of Chicago common bricks because that's the brick that Chicago was made out of. Uh, and they made one and a half billion of those a year in the 1910s and 20s. And so they're they're everywhere. And there's lying in the streets. You can grab one really easy. Some are a little more rare. So on the front of buildings, we have what are called face bricks. And those are the nicer bricks they put on just the front. And those come from outside of Chicago. And so you'll find sometimes one has fallen off a building or one has been discarded. You know, you'll find uh, that maybe in a, in a trash heap, you know, on the edge of the woods. And I'll grab those. But a lot of them I get through trade. So I'm a member of the International Brick Collectors Association. And we trade. We trade with each other. There are big brick swaps that happen three times a year in places where people will bring a bunch of bricks. You know, they lay out what they're willing to trade and they see what other people have. I haven't had a chance to go to one of those yet, but they're really, you know, the way it works is you, you look around, see what people have, and you put your foot on a brick. And then if they, that you put your foot on a brick, that's like, this is the brick I really want. And you sort of stand there and chat with people. And then like a whistle is blown and it's time to trade and you grab that. And then you go around and you grab all the other ones you want. You get in your truck and you go home. There's also trading by mail. I've done a lot of mail trading by mail over the last year. So medium flat rate box can pretty easily fit three bricks wrapped in double wrap, uh, about 15 bucks. So my McFeely fire brick, I had mailed to me by a woman from Western Pennsylvania. 
I offered to trade her, but she had a collection. She's got a collection of about 4,000. So she was just looking to get rid uh, of some of them. And it sounds like it's like a, an opportunity to meet people. It's such a distinct interest. And here you are in this swimming in these waters where you all have this one thing in common. It sounds like it's a really cool way to meet people who really see the same things you see. Yeah, exactly. And that's what I love so much about bricks in Chicago and, and brick in the world is it you are constantly surrounded. I can go anywhere in Chicago and I'll be surrounded by brick because of the way the city was built and because of the building codes. And it makes it so much more fun to engage with the world and with the city in that way. You know, I'm not just walking down a street. I'm, I'm looking and seeing what is building up all these different places. And, and, you know, so you can go in anywhere you want and you'll find so much stuff if you know what you're looking for and spend all your free time reading about it like I do. And it sounds too like a sort of practice in presence. You know, we all leave our homes and are on autopilot or we're staring at our screens and we're anxious about the future and anxious about the past. And here we have these beautiful bricks in front of us that we could learn about and know about and pause in front of and appreciate. It sounds like it's like a, almost like a, a Buddhist practice of presence for you. Yeah, it's absolutely a mindfulness thing for me. It, it really is because it's it's keeping me aware of my surroundings and engaging at a deeper level with, with what is, is happening around me, both in terms of the building itself, but also all of the little individual pieces and details that make up a structure. The, the thing I, on my tours I always liken brick to is, is like brushstrokes in a Van Gogh. Each individual unit is a beautiful piece of a more beautiful whole. You get all these individual bricks are so colorful and textural, or they might be uniform and crisp, and then they're being used to create this structure in all sorts of different ways and details. What would be the brick that I could arrange to get to you that would be the most prized, the most special? What would that most prized brick be? I mean, before this year, I would have said this McFeely fire brick. And now I think I don't, I'm from Minnesota originally, and I don't have any bricks from Minnesota. And there are a couple bricks, there's a particular one, Minnesota vitrified, uh, it's stamped with Minnesota on it. That is apparently pretty rare. I've, I've been posting, I've posted in the Facebook groups, trying to see if anyone has one that they're willing to trade. And the responses I've got in, indicate that it, it seems like it's pretty rare. Because you get a lot of, you know, brickmakers only produce for a few years or a, a couple of decades and then shut down. And that, so it's a very much a limited supply in that way. That's a, that, trying to find that one is sort of a fun insight into the community too, because when I posted asking about it, someone responded, if you get one, I'll give you a box of Purington's for it, which if you're a brick collector is a funny joke. Purington pavers are street pavers, you know, big, hard blocky bricks stamped Purington on them. And they were made in Galesburg, Illinois. Uh, and what found their way all over the country, they were specified to be used for the Panama, uh, roads around the Panama Canal, really good pavers, but they're everywhere. And so it's a joke amongst brick collectors that, you know, you'll give somebody a bunch of Purington's for it uh, because everybody's got one. I have two people have, you know, I probably have one. You probably have one in your backyard. Hey, do you know any other brick jokes? Do I know any other brick jokes? Um, I, I mean, for a while, I would post on my Instagram that I learned everything from the Brictionary. Or on uh, Halloween, I had a little sign with a cutout of the, of the shape of a brick that I put on a wall that said brick or treat uh, on it, stuff like that. I'm, I'm big into, I used to be a middle school theater teacher, so I'm big into puns. Oh, yeah. You are uh, in good company right now. And, you know, I'm thinking, I always use a, a relevant song to go out of a segment with. And the first song I think of is Brick House, but I feel like that's too easy, right? You know, it's it's easy, but it's good. I think Ben Fold's Brick would maybe be inappropriate uh, for, uh, for this based on the, the content, but I uh, I like Brick House. It's it's great. I'd I, I love I'd love to have a Brick House someday. I want that for you, Will. I mean, would you live in anything other than a Brick House? I mean, is that even an option? No, I don't think so. Not, especially not in Chicago, uh, you right. know. And that's that is part of the curse in that I'm an artist and I would love to own, own a, have a, you know, I have all these books of, you know, modern, crazy brick houses that are being built in Europe uh, that I would love to have my own someday. But 
we'll see. We'll see. But the, the goal is always to yeah live in a brick building. For those who collect a ton of bricks, how do they store them? I imagine that structural integrity, I mean, you can't, you can't put it on like a third floor walk up, right? So there's a guy, the guy who has the largest collection, uh, I believe I'm correct, is in Germany. And he's about 9,000. And he had to strengthen, and he lived in an apartment and he had to strengthen the floors, put in new supports on the floors. In the U.S., it's mostly people who live in rural areas. I'm the only one in Chicago who's a member of the Collectors uh, Association. And so they, ju- they just have space. You know, a guy named Jim, who's the secretary of the organization, lives south of Chicago. He's a former art teacher. And his, his, his collection started because he wanted to build this path in his backyard. And he started using reclaimed bricks for it. And then that led to all this collecting. So he's got this big path. But then a lot of people have sheds too, or barns even, uh, where they still keep their bricks. And I keep mine, you know, they're sort of the show bricks, the bricks that I used, you know, on my tours and stuff, I keep next to me on my on my windowsill, but I have a bookcase as well. But these people have big, huge shelves of cubbies, basically, where, you know, they've got, if you've got your brick, well, this is a tapestry brick, it's got, you know, this wonderful script uh, on the face where this can sit in a cubby facing out uh, with a nice piece forward. But again, it tends to be people who have land uh, and place to store it. It gets tricky, though, then if you move. For example, a friend of mine or an internet friend of mine who uh, is a collector, he moved house from a rural area to a more urban area, and he just left, he just left the collection behind. He took a couple that were important or, or rare, but he just left the rest. I read that you plan your vacations based on where in the world uh, great bricks are available for your eyes and your heart and your senses. Where in the world haven't you been yet that you would take a vacation and it would be like the biggest brick payoff? Oh, I mean, I've never been to Italy. I've never been to Germany. I haven't been to London in, in a decade and a half. The biggest goal would be go to Germany and spend a month plus there in your various cities photographing. You know, I just went to Houston uh, a little while ago, mostly to visit friends, but also every day had an excursion uh, planned in it as well. I'm hoping to spend, you know, at least three weeks in Philadelphia at some point soon, because that was, is a real major brick center of the United States and, and, and sort of epicenter of brick making technology in the 1800s. But yeah, every every place I go now, I'm always planning on where I can go find bricks. And if I've driven, how can I get a brick home with me as well? Well, if you ever make it to Hartford, you right, I will right. take you to the Mark Twain house. And you can gaze upon those bricks and, and touch them. I won't tell. Good. Okay, cool, cool, cool. I mean, that is that is one of the great things about brick collecting is it's so tied to places. You know, that's that's a thing I really love. And I think for other brick collectors also really love it, about the, 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 the practice is that you get to have a physical piece of a place, you know, a place that is meaningful to you or meaningful to the world in some way. You have a real physical piece of it. And that is so cool and makes it so much more memorable and so much more meaningful than something like a photograph. Um, I have one from Herpo Studios uh, where Oprah's show was filmed. I've got one from the old Paps Brewing Complex in Milwaukee. I've got my Mr. Rogers brick, of course. I have a, a piece of terracotta from the Berwyn Theater, an old theater that was demolished here. It's all about having these physical reminders of a place. For those who hear this and they think, huh, I feel like I kind of want to check out some bricks. I want to yeah. learn. I want to read all the books on bricks. And there are books on bricks that you also collect. What's your advice for folks who want to get started on this? Where do you even start with something that seems so ubiquitous? In terms of learning, you know, there are a couple of great books. There's a book called Brick, A World History by Campbell and Price, was team of a photographer and a researcher who went all over the world together. And so everything they talk about, there are these beautiful photographs of, including Chicago, they came to Chicago, but they went everywhere around the world. That is such a great place to start. In terms of collecting, I always recommend people go to alleys. If you go to, if you go in an alley, that's where you're most likely to find bricks just lying around. 
you know, the first brick I collected was a, I still have it, a, a pretty generic mass produced modern brick that was left over from when my local dry cleaner redid their facade. And it's not very cool. It's not very meaningful, but it was the first brick I just found. And I was like, okay, I'm going to keep this. This is, this is mine. My first brick. I can already see like the, the kid's book. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, you just find, just find it and, and then start to find other ones and see how are they the same? How are they different? A big thing a lot of collectors do is research where former brick uh, manufacturing plants were. Sometimes they're still operational, but a lot of times those are, they're just kind of overgrown, you know, wood areas, wooded areas now. And you can go dig around and you can find a ton of bricks there. Because there's just, you know, they had so many and they're just there. A lot of times collectors won't tell you where they found them, though, because they don't want these places to get ransacked. And that also goes back to why the Collectors Association bans buying and selling. These historic bricks are a limited resource. And we don't want to create this, you know, economy of people trying to tear down buildings or dig up old sites to sell this stuff. You know, we, we'd much rather keep it a thing of, of pe- people who are just passionate about it and wanting, wanting to collect these things. Once we start charging for them, then it becomes much more a thing where buildings could become endangered. You have the case of St. Louis, where St. Louis's clays produced these really smooth, beautiful red bricks. You'll find them in Chicago neighborhoods from the late 1800s because uh, crisp red was the fashion uh, all over the United States at that time. I'm sure you got a lot of, of that in Connecticut. And a lot of those bricks are made in St. Louis. So you go to St. Louis, even these small little houses, these workers' houses are covered in this brick because it was the local material and it was cheaper than bringing something in from out of town. But what happens then is you get these houses that are empty, these buildings that are empty. This happens a lot in historically black neighborhoods that saw a ton of you know, municipal divestment or interstates plowing through them, where the buildings themselves are sound but empty. But people will back trucks into them in the middle of the night, knock, knock the back wall out. And then resell that brick at a really high markup because it's it's really valuable. It's really valuable. People really want it. Uh, and then the whole house has to then come down. Uh, and so you get these buildings that could otherwise be reused by communities that are being knocked down because the brick is more valuable. And that happens a little bit in Chicago as well. The Chicago common brick is really prized as well now. It hasn't been made since 1981. But people love it because it's so varied, because it's so weird and messy, which was the very thing that people hated about it in the 1800s. And now it's what they prize about it. And so it's being sent by in the train loop to mostly to the South, honestly. The South loves Chicago common brick. And so a lot of times buildings will be demolished before their brick because the brick is the valuable thing. And so as collectors, we don't want that to happen. I would much prefer, I, I would give up my brick collection if people can have buildings uh, in their neighborhoods to live in. And so we want to encourage that rather than people trying to knock down buildings just for the bricks. Well, Quam, thank you for educating me and talking with me. Thank you. Will does brick walking tours in Chicago, and you can join over 17,000 other people who love the bricks on his Instagram, Brick of Chicago. Audacious is produced by me, Jessica Severin D. Martinez, and Katie Tolarski at Connecticut Public Radio in Hartford, with our interns Abi Levine and Dylan Reyes. Our special assistant producer today was Sophia Martinez. And we've decided to collect stories just like these. So if you know someone who has an uncommon collection, the kind that stops you in your tracks, like our friends in this episode did, holler. My email is cwolf at ctpublic.org or find me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Wolf. Subscribe to Audacious and you'll always get to hear the show a day early. Plus, you can listen back to shows featuring things like the psychology, history, and contradictions behind many superstitions what it felt like to find out at the age of 25 that you have an identical twin. And when you've got the Guinness World Record for largest female mouth in the world, what can you fit in it? You can hear them all at ctpublic.org slash audacious or wherever you get your podcasts. And thanks for leaving that review on Apple Podcasts. The more of those we get, the more the algorithm of the unfeeling podcast machine knows to feature our show on the Apple main page. Thank you so much for listening. Shut the cow, shut the cow, shut the cow now.